Hi, welcome back to Reimagine. Uh, you know, here we are at the ninth iteration uh, of this conference, a, a pretty staggering point and, and such an interesting point of inflection uh, given where we started. You know, this, this conference started back in 2020 uh, with you know, the peak of uh, the coronavirus, everyone's locked down, everyone's turning to virtual currencies. So this is a very pointed time, uh, I think, to be you know, hitting this ninth iteration and speaking uh, with our guest today, an old friend of the conference, an old friend of the show, uh, uh, you know, a, a crypto stalwart and a, a man who uh, understands you know, the larger financial things of the world here to help uh, educate, teach and preach to those out there. I'm talking, of course, about none other than Mark Yusko. Mark, firstly, thanks so much for being with us. No, thanks for being with me. And uh, nine is my lucky number. So this is going to be a, an epic special show. All, all the more relevance. And I think I want to kick that off. You know, I started off with that idea of the theme that, you know, back in, in 2020, we were going into, into lockdowns, you know, everyone was, was afraid, didn't know what the future looked like, everyone was, didn't know what was going on. And you, uh, not to, you know, not to date this at a point, but you have just gotten back from Miami, uh, where you were at the spectacular conference there that has caught the world's attention, you know, the first yeah. major scale conference uh, to come out in the real world, people face to face, talking, meeting, but you know, I know, no, just, just un unbelievable on every front. And <clears throat> I'll apologize up front for the the scratchy voice, uh, the tired <laughs> it's eyes. Of a good time, you know? it's, it's good. And uh, look, it it was a, a spectacular four days. Uh, twelve thousand people. I mean, twelve thousand people. Uh, everybody there engaged. Uh, so much going on, uh, incredible, incredible content. You know, everybody in the Bitcoin space was, was there uh, talking, sharing, interacting, building uh, relationships, uh, some history making announcements. I mean, it was, it was truly, truly dazzling. And uh, I, I fortunately made a couple good decisions to uh, truncate my evenings so I, I don't look like complete mess um, but uh, it was it was really uh, an amazing event and and we're back right we're, we're back uh, as a, a, a local physical community that doesn't mean these will stop uh, the mm -hmm. power of zoom and the power of these virtual events is has been proven to be very profound uh, the ability to share, uh, message and and uh, you know evangelize and preach is is extended on such a more global basis as as great as the conference was, you know it was still mostly mostly Americans uh, although there were a lot of people in from from all over the world but it was still mostly Americans and um, it would it, and but but it was live streamed around the world and I think a lot of people benefited. From, from being engaged. So the Reimagine really started this wave of uh, global virtual engagement and I'm, I'm uh, privileged to be part of it. You know, Mark, I, I suppose I wonder, now we're getting back, you know, to, to being together, to, to people getting back, it, back in place, you get this excitement and you get this hype. But, you know, I was looking at a lot of the reporting coming on in, in mainstream media, which was reported widely about this uh, conference in Miami. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people are interested, aware, you know, everyone from the New York Times, The Economist are putting articles together, uh, you know, but I suppose I wonder, a lot of those articles still seem to, you know, frame a lot of what went on there as, you know, a bit of a circus, a bit of an oddity, a bit of a eccentricity, I, I don't know what word to put it, but there, there was a tinge of, of uh, pedantry or condescension or, or something that maybe came through. Maybe oh, I'm look, I, I have a hashtag for it, Ash. I mean, haters going to hate. Uh, <laughs> the haters are, are just not going to accept this. They're going to they're gonna say, oh, well, you know, uh, three years ago, you only had, you know, a couple thousand people. So it clearly isn't important. I mean, it just now that 12,000 people showed up. Oh, well, now it's just a circus. I mean, it just, it's all just the, the, the crazy. <laughs> Come on, guys. Um, it's look, incumbency is a curse. Incumbency is a curse. Incumbent media, right? What we're doing today, what we've been doing over the course of the past, you know, 15, 16 months with Reimagine is redefining media in, in some ways. And, and the incumbents don't like that. 
I mean, there were some great stats. I mean, Michael Saylor pulled, pulled out some great stats. He said the, the CEO of ExxonMobil made a huge announcement of something they were doing on CNBC. And he had like 3,000 views, right? Says the video I made uh, talking about, you know, Bitcoin the other day got 750,000 views on Twitter. Okay, that's a bigger audience. That that's <laughs> broader bigger. reach. That's that's, that's more impact. And so incumbents are going to say, "Oh, it doesn't matter that 12,000 people showed up in Miami to talk about Bitcoin because we're over here doing doing the good work about the traditional financial system and you know, we're not going to be disrupted and we're going to be fine." Sure, fine. Um and the reality is that incumbents will always eventually be displaced, right? I mean, you know, I was talking with this, this uh, guy on the, on the plane ride home uh, about education, right? Education is on the verge of just unbelievable disruption. And, uh, you know, the universities are all like, oh, no, it's going to be fine. I mean, we're, we're going we're gonna to offer same courses, same content, and charge the same amount. In fact, our prices are going to go up and everything's going to be great. No, it, it's not. And uh, the world is is going to change and you can choose to change with it or you can choose to ignore it. And I, I tell the joke all the time about the, the ostrich, right? The ostrich is on the savanna and the lion comes out of the bush and the ostrich famously turns his back to the lion, lays his head down on the sand or there, I guess, he or she, their head down on the sand and pretends the lion can't see them. The lion still eats the ostrich. The ostrich just doesn't see it happen. So, you know, ignoring Miami and what it, what it represented is, is a fool's errand. At your own peril, perhaps. But I suppose I wonder, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. It, it's a favorite game of mine because I think it helps to bring out some of the, the best perspectives here. But, you know, when we look at something like, say, Miami or, or say a, a lot of the, you know, the user engagement, the 750,000 views, uh, you know, coming out from Michael Saylor versus you know, Exxon, yeah. I suppose I wonder, you know, how many retail, uh, you know, purchases, how many sort of, uh, you know, man on the on the omnibus or, or whatnot, is it going to take to compare to say, you know, find the Exxon announcement only gets noticed by 3000 people, but one of them happened to be BlackRock CEO. Is yeah. that surely yeah. not more important? I mean, you know, if I'm playing the devil's advocate here, does it matter masses or does it matter who's got the dollars? And where the dollars no, are? it's such a fantastic point. And and you know we talk about this all the time, you know, like with likes, right? Likes on on social media, they're not the same, right? A like from someone with no knowledge or no appreciation of a subject is clearly not as valuable as you know if you post something on nutrition, and a bunch of people like it. Okay, fine. But if someone who actually knows about nutrition, who's an expert on nutrition, likes it, that has more authority. And so there's no no question that that quality. Is, is more important than quantity. But there is a point at which the quantity will have some quality in it, right? You can't have all low quality in that, in that massive number. And, and the reality is my guess is that the CIO of BlackRock is one of those 750,000 people who saw Michael talking about, about energy usage and the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt around the, the nonsense that spewed about uh, the carbon footprint of, of Bitcoin relative to you know, the traditional financial system. And I, I will say there, there's one good point that does get brought up, which is it's not the total power usage, it's the usage per transaction. But then again, what people are, are missing is that uh, Bitcoin is, is not designed to be a transaction system. Right, it it is slow and secure to be a base layer payment rail or settlement rail that other things like Lightning ne Network and and third layer systems will be built upon. Same way that Visa and Mastercard work relative to to money, right? Visa and Mastercard don't take my money except once a month. I use it all the time. I use that silly little card all the time. But this is they just keep a spreadsheet of what I do. And then they settle up once a month and they settle with the bank and, and that's a good service and I'm willing to pay for it and the merchants are willing to pay for it. But what's coming is a total revamp of that going from electronic to digital. 
And some of the things that, that I saw down, I, I, I'll give you an example. So I was talking to this entrepreneur who built and sold one of the biggest ad tech businesses. So he doesn't have to work, but, but he still works because he's got the, the heart of a lion and the mind of an entrepreneur. And, and he's building this new thing. And, and long story short, it's, it's an idea for uh, monetizing all content. So like what we're doing right now, he's got a, an app that when someone's viewing this, there would be a way for, for them to view it. They'd have to make a micro payment using Lightning Network, uh, you know, fractions of, of pennies or, or pennies uh, to, to view the content. And you could actually tip the content creators and you could add to the community. And, and it happens instantaneously in real time on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. It doesn't settle to the Bitcoin blockchain every time. That would be silly. But it accumulates all of this you know, payment activity through Lightning and then settles up inside the app. And that's going to be monstrous. The creator economy and the ability to go direct, direct to your customer instead of the chain. Think about the old music industry. The artist created the music and then it went to the label and then it went to the distributor and then it went to here and then it went to the music, sta the radio stations. And by the time it got onto a CD and into the hand of the consumer, how many people got paid and how little did the artists actually get, right? I think the artists make very little from their albums. Well, I call it an album. People call it an MP3. <laughs> uh, I'm old. Um, he said, I'm one of your oldest friends, which I thought it's nice. But uh, uh, today, um, you know, they make all their money on touring. Well, now they're going to be able to make money direct to consumer and artists and creators and innovators all of this is going to move into the digital age. And that's why it was a Bitcoin conference. And people are like, oh, it's just about rah rah fanboys, because it's mostly still guys. I think it was 90% guys, unfortunately. We need more women in, in the business. But uh, just a bunch of fanboys, you know, patting each other on the back and riding around in each other's Lambos and getting drunk. And there was some of that, although actually not as much as I expected to see. Far, few, far fewer Lambos than I expected. And, and most people acting pretty business-like. Um, but the, it was much more about building and thinking about the future. And look, and you know, there are people love and, and not love Jack at, at Twitter and Square. Mm -hmm. But when a guy with his intellectual capacity, intellectual curiosity, his ability to build execute and make vision a reality, which no one can argue with, right? You can argue with a lot of things, but you can't argue with any of that. To have a guy get up there and say, look, if, if I weren't running these two businesses, I would spend every waking hour working on increasing the adoption of, of Bitcoin more broadly around the world and making an impact. That's pretty profound and pretty powerful. So, I mean, that's a good, uh, a good segue into my next point and the next idea, and, you know, to touch on the, the overarching theme of this conference, which is a game of chains and that idea of so many, uh, you know, different chains and protocols out there all battling it out, the supremacy, you know, all trying to get that little piece of the, the Metcalf's law yeah. pie and, and get their little, uh, their wedge uh, grown in. And I suppose, you know, I wonder looking at that idea and, and thinking about, you know, how uh, different, you know, protocols and ideas can grow and develop and, and find a, a space in this here we are in this in this bull market here we are and well whether it's still a bull market or not but still the hype is still there from it uh, uh whether it still exists and and there's so much excitement there's so much energy but you know people always say crypto winters are for building and you know the the bull markets are for sort of the hype and the sort of yeah. the nonsense to come through yep. i mean you know reflecting on that idea are you seeing that in action what are you what do you think that people are forgetting to do the, the core maintenance and building an infrastructure or is that still going on behind the scenes no it's a really important point and let me unpack kind of two sub points in there so one is is this idea of yes there is all out kind of war you know i mean war is probably the wrong but all out battle for uh getting a piece of of this growing ecosystem and you know very similar to to the internet when you know they started with 80 protocols eight zero and today we have five or six 
that do most of the, the heavy lifting and TCP IP really at the bottom of that base layer. And I think the same thing's happening in the space. And one thing that I, I don't like, and then it was funny, uh, you know, I was one of the very first people invited to speak at this conference two years ago when it, re- it was supposed to be last year. So two years ago, they invited me really early in the process. And I'm like, sure, you know, I'll do it. And, uh, and then it got canceled and I kind of forgot about it. And they did everything like most people do. They, they know that I'm, I stink at email. So they did all through my assistant. And so someone said, hey, are you going to Miami? I'm like, uh, no, I think I'm, I'm going to a, wed- a family wedding this weekend. And I, I don't think I am. And my assistant says, you know, you're speaking, right? I'm like, oh, oh yes, I'm definitely going to Miami. And I just totally, because it was two years ago that they asked me. Sure. And, uh, and so a couple weeks ago, uh, I made one comment. And I made comments about lots of stuff. And I made one comment that was positive about, about Ethereum. And a whole bunch of people were like, you should be disinvited from Bitcoin 2021. This is a Bitcoin conference and we don't want your time. Like, Tribalism is a bad look. It is just not uh, useful. And do I think there should be a healthy competition and, and tension between layer one technologies? And, and I do believe there will be one. Right. And I don't actually view Ethereum and Bitcoin as the same. If actually people actually listen to what I said. Uh, and I think they can both coexist. And it's possible that one might exist and the other might not. It's po- look, anything's possible because we're still in the, the early stages of this. But right. in terms of to your, your second point about uh, is the building still going on? Oh my gosh, the building is going on in space, the talent migration is like nothing I've ever seen. I mean, the, the, the early 90s talent migration was amazing, right? People from all walks of life coming into the internet, building companies with crazy names, Yahoo and eBay and and uh, Google, which now is a verb. And, you know, at the time sounded like a silly name for a company, but uh, works out, works out all right. But now the talent migration is orders of magnitude bigger, orders of magnitude better. And I don't mean it's better because the people that did the 90s weren't good. It's just everything builds on 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 the history, right? As, as Newton said, right? I didn't really do much. I just stood on the shoulders of giants. I'm like, no, Newton, you did, you did pretty much good stuff. You're a pretty smart guy. But he did stand on the shoulders of giants. And, and the people today, we stand on the shoulders of the people that came for us and we just have better technology. We have better tools. We have better information. We have better knowledge. We have better science which by the way is an iterative process. It's not static, just a little sidebar. Um, and so all of, of what's happening today is just so exciting. And, and this conference was an example of that. I mean, I met with lots of creators and innovators and, and technologists who are working on very compelling technology. Um, so it isn't just that the bear markets bring out the best because you have nothing else to do because you got to get to work. Um, But I think in this bull market, now, I guess there is some question, are we still in the bull market? Did the bull market end, you know, early and are now we in the bear phase? There's, there's some debate to be had there. Uh, I know the, the maxis are all like, nope, nope, nope. We're going to, you know, moon by the end of the year. Still a non-zero probability. I do think there is some non-zero probability that because everyone was looking at the same models, that some big guys front run the normal cyclical peak, and now we're at a funky kind of deleveraging and consolidation part of the cycle that probably shouldn't have happened until the fall. Okay, well, I mean, let, let me let me press you on those uh, points there. While we're in the in the sort of realm of, of price and market movement and whatnot, you know, you say that you think that might that might be a possibility. It might be a non-zero possibility. But you know, to sort of delve in. Do you see this uh, bull market as having ended? I mean, at the end of the day, as much as people talk a, a good game uh, about you know development and being here for technology, yep. people are interested in the price. That is, yeah. that is uh, yeah, look, you, you know how out. I feel about this. That you know, hashtag price is a liar. Right. The price of the network does not matter. Long term, the price does not matter. What matters is the fundamentals. 
-hmm. Now that's this is long term, and right. the fundamentals are all improving, right? The number of users, the number of wallets, the number, you know the blocks, the transactions, all that stuff continues to be up and to the right. Hash power, you know, difficulty, everything, everything is good from a fundamental perspective, and I think Miami proved that more talent is coming into space, more innovations coming into space more adoption. I mean, Jack Mahler's from Zap, which is a portfolio company of ours, announced that you know he went to El Salvador and he got you know the president to back legislation to make it a legal tender. That's a pretty big deal, right? I mean, it, it may or may not happen, but it's a pretty darn big deal. Um, everybody says, oh, but well, El Salvador doesn't matter. It's a country, right? It's, it's, it's a legitimate you know, step in, in the right direction. And so, uh, you go from there to short term. And while price doesn't matter, it does to traders and speculators and unfortunately gamblers. And I talk about this, right? There are four types of market participants, investors who buy things because the current price is below the fair value or near fair value or approaching fair value. But, but they usually sell things when the price gets above fair value. Then you have speculators who buy things because the you know, I mean, I'm sorry, then you have traders and traders do both buying and selling depending on trends in the market. And they have a shorter time horizon, shorter time horizon. Some are intermediate term, some are short term, uh, some are day traders, some are high frequency traders, you know, seconds, milliseconds. Then you got speculators. Speculators actually don't do much work, right? They, they buy stuff because it's moving or somebody told them to. Uh, the real problem though is the gamblers, right? The gamblers like what we're seeing in AMC and GameStop and, and, and some of the, the really illiquid tokens, like the one that shall not be named that I hate, you know, people don't seem to understand that, that gambling is not, not just a zero sum game, it's a negative sum game, right? The house always wins <laughs> and Goldman Sachs will win just like they always do, just like Vegas always does. And ultimately these, day traders trading to each other, there will be some winners in the short run, but the only true winner is someone who wins early and gets out. If you stay around, you'll eventually give it all back and, and, and bad things will happen. So I do think that, I said, to me, if we just focus on Bitcoin for a second, Bitcoin price went parabolic earlier in the cycle than it probably should have partly because of this gambling problem post the lockdowns, right? Lockdowns happen. You can't gamble on sports because sports shut down. You can't go to Vegas, you can't go to Macau. So, and then on top of it, the government gives you money. So you got this free money. You gotta do something with it. You gotta do something with it. So, <laughs> hey, I'll open a day trading account and I'll day trade and I'll go on Reddit and we'll do this thing. Right. And, Oh, look, and now crypto and I can, I, I got Robinhood and Robinhood not only let me do crypto, they'll let me do crypto on leverage or I can go to Binance and get really big leverage. Um, so leverage took us way up. And, and the thing that made me the most nervous, Ash, is uh, Michael Burry, right? Michael Burry, smart guy. But let's just leave it at that. He's a smart guy. Um, and... <laughs> He's just way smarter than, than the average bear. And he said, look, guys, I'm, I have no dog in this fight, plus or minus, but I'm telling you, the average person does not appreciate how much leverage is driving this, this movement from kind of eight, 9,000 up to, to 60,000. Mm. And look, I don't have any verification that he's on the other side short. It's likely, um, but that's not someone I want to be on the other side of a trade from just right. personally. Right. And so I do worry, I said, everyone was focused on stock to flow. Everybody saw the hundred thousand dollar number in July. And now look, four years ago, no one knew about that because it didn't exist. There were a couple people looking at parabolic models, Metcalf's law. I had posted one from 2014 that I found. So there were a handful of people or a couple handfuls of people talking about it. Everybody's talking about it. When that's true, when everybody's talking about the same thing, that leaves you vulnerable to attack. And I'm not saying it happened, but it certainly could have. And then on top of it, you got the, you know, the Elon FUD. And look, 
I have a very strong opinion on this. My hashtag fork Elon. I think he absolutely intentionally uh, tried to tank the price. Uh, he says he didn't sell. I call bullshit. Uh, I think he shorted against the box um, because if he didn't sell or he didn't short against the box, he's going to have to report a meaningful loss in the Q2 statements. And he doesn't make any money selling cars. So uh, he will have a, a significant problem. Um, so I, I hate it. Adobe tries to take over my computer. So I <laughs> no. said something, I said something about Elon and Elon probably, you know, told <laughs> Adobe. Anyway, um, so anyway, I answered a question you didn't ask. Yeah. Well, no, and that's fine. And that's good because it lead me to my, my next thing. My and, and, you know, you spoke about fundamentals there. And, you know, at the end of the day, the fundamentals are key. And this is so interesting because when you've got things, you know, you've got news bombarding people from all, all sectors, and particularly those who are, who are new, uh, you know, a little jittery in the industry, you know, uh, don't, don't really sort of have a surety about what's a reliable source, what's an unreliable source. You've got things ranging from, as you said, Elon Musk tweeting love and hate, you know, over the course of a few weeks, seeming to switch positions uh, because he didn't do his research, uh, you know, what's going on there. Uh, you, then you've got, uh, you know, news like China uh, coming out, you know, sort of with their latest crackdowns. You know, even just today, I'm, I'm seeing the latest news is they're cracking down on, on Weibo accounts that uh, link to cryptocurrencies. Then you've got, you know, your Jack Marlers and, uh, and the El Salvador news, which, you know, seems very bullish. But, but how bullish yeah. is it really? I mean, it's El Salvador. And on the other hand, we've got China and Elon Musk. It doesn't seem like a fair side by side. You know, as a man driven by fundamentals, how do you how do you break this down into component yeah. parts that are, are manageable? Look, I mean, I said every fundamental that I look at and track and think about is all positive. And you know, someone asked me, so so what are you doing? I said, I'm doing what I always do. I'm buying. And this, what do you mean? Like, what are you gonna do if it goes to twenty? I'll buy more. And because I don't buy it all at once. All right. I buy a little bit all the time. And, you know, there's the CNBC clip where, you know, it crashed from like 10,000 to 8,000, literally while I'm on the, the, the TV and Melissa says, you know, what should we do? I'm like, you should buy it. And they're all like, what do you mean? Buy it. I'm like, yeah, you should buy it today and buy it tomorrow and buy it the next day and next week and the week after. And it's not about the price, right? Price is a liar. It's about accumulating ownership of the network. If you don't own a piece of this network, the most valuable computing network in the history of mankind, you're missing it. And I'm not saying you should put all your net worth, never have, but you need to have a portion of your net worth in this asset, in this network. And so I look at it as um, in the short run, right? Meaning weeks and months and, and even years, uh, single years, the, the short run can be manipulated by FUD. It can be manipulated, unfortunately, by people. Uh, and it's because it's still, a, it's still not a very deep market. You know, even though there are lots of people that participate, so many are hodlers or hodlers, however you want to pronounce it, you know, tomato, tomato, uh, that, that just aren't going to trade. And therefore, the free float, so to speak, of the network is, is relatively small and really can be manipulated by, by a handful of large users or owners. And whether it's China, uh, China is playing this game masterfully, right? They want the digital renminbi to be the first digital central bank currency, and they will win. They don't want people to, I think, confuse it with cryptocurrency. And so they are, you know, being tough, quote unquote, on, on cryptocurrency and decentralized currency because they want people to understand that currency is what governments issue. Right. And Ultimately, I think maybe that's maybe that's part of the problem is maybe we shouldn't have called it cryptocurrency. Maybe we should have called it crypto money because money is different than currency. Money right. Right, is, is something that has value and doesn't have an associated liability. Like gold is money. Bitcoin is a digital form of money. Uh, currency isn't money. I mean, it's used as money, but it, it suffers from the problem that it has an associated liability through government debt. And that's why through the history of money, why, you know, I got to participate in this fantastic project you guys are working on. And, you know, we did the whole history of money in, in the first episode. And, and 
you know, has a long history of failure, right? I mean, there've been 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters no longer exist. I mean, they're gone, like vaporized, vanished. And every one that is issued by fiat, meaning at government capriciousness, will eventually uh, leave. In fact, I was walking around Miami with the shirt, you know, keep calm, we'll print more. Um, and that's the reality is the central banks are going to print more. And when you, when you increase the supply of an asset with relatively fixed demand, what happens to the price or the value? It goes down. Conversely, in Bitcoin, we have a fixed supply and we have rising demand. So inevitably, the price is going to rise. And the problem is the day-to-day -day price doesn't reflect that value Right? It reflects the greed and fear of the participants. And if there are too many gamblers, speculators, and traders versus investors, then you're going to get higher volatility and, and wider dispersion and, and actually, quite honestly, greater opportunities for those who want to accumulate over the long term. And I've made this case on Twitter that I believe that uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Musk is probably practicing the age old Wall Street secret that when you wanna buy something, you actually sell it short first and spread negative rumors about it to push the price down so you can acquire it at a better price. And that's not unique to Mr. Musk and Bitcoin, look at lots of people who've done M&A over the years, trying to buy your competitor or you know, trying to invest in a, a new technology. You don't pump it up so you pay a higher price, right? I mean, pretty logical. I mean, so then, I mean, could we say in a way that we're seeing the, the final yeah. death throes, as it were, of the resistance to uh, you know, Wall Street and, and sort of the establishment's resistance to, to cryptocurrencies, maybe to Bitcoin specifically. Oh, we're not at the death seeing... throws yet. No, we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely far along in the decay, but, but they got a lot of fight left in them. And, and, and they haven't even really tried the nasty stuff, right? I mean, in, I said incumbency is a curse and incumbents when backed into a corner, when a dog is backed into the corner, they get, they get mean. And we haven't seen mean yet, right? You know, China banned the exchanges, kind of shot across the bow. So what did the exchanges do? They literally picked up and moved to Japan and South Korea and nobody missed a beat. Now the price fell 40% in 2017 when they did that. And then it went up, you know, tenfold the rest of the year. And it's up you know, 20 fold since then. So no, 25 fold. And so now China says, all right, now we're, we're going to crack down on the miners. So literally one of the topics in Miami, they had a bunch of the big mining firms up there. And they said, yeah, we're onboarding so many machines out of China. People are literally picking up the machines, <laughs> moving them to other places. So they're, they're, they're you know, look, these are entrepreneurs. They're business people. They're not just going to stop because China said, oh, you're not welcome here. Fine. I'll go someplace else. And uh, it's kind of like when states in the U.S. ban Bitcoin mining or crypto mining. Well, there are 50 states. I just go to a different one or go to Canada or go to the Virgin Islands. Or I mean, there are lots of places you can go. And th the cool thing about all of this is like, you know, we live in an increasingly borderless world. Although the lockdowns were an example of incumbency trying to enforce this no borders matter and, and we can lock the borders and we can we can restrict your movement yeah you can but people found a way around it right i i there was i talked to somebody who was in florida and i said well how'd you get here he's like well i'm technically not supposed to be here because i'm from the uk so i flew to dubai and then i flew here and then i got in <laughs> like, okay people are creative right. so they they found a way um and Regulations have been threatened, but nobody's really done anything. Um, it, you know, one of the things that I thought was interesting, this is an interesting offhand comment. Uh, so uh, Ross Ulbricht's mom was at the conference and, you know, the free Ross movement. 
And I mean, we just got chit chatting after the, the thing. And, and he said, you know, people lobbied really hard to get the pardon from Trump and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty close, but there was, there was this group of financial services executives that were just wow. adamantly against it and willing to pay anything to stop it. Like, wow, that's not like wow. criminal justice people. That, that was people who were, in their words, afraid that, that his release would legitimize mm. this alternative marketplace. And there's a whole bunch of other things that we don't even have time to unpack right, unpack right now, but it is pretty scary stuff to think that you're messing with a person's life, really. Um, and there are people who have done way, 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 way worse stuff. Way, like not even close. Right. You spent not one minute in jail. Right. And, and I think this guy has definitely paid his, his debt to society. And, uh, and I keep coming back to the fact that, look, if you wanna make, <laughs> it's like people say, well, guns don't kill people. People kill people, right? Marketplaces don't kill people. The drugs they bought on the marketplace maybe did some bad, you know, but a marketplace is is pretty tough to, to say that's the, the evildoer. Right. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's a, such a powerful point on Ross. And as you say, it would be great to unpack that further. But I, I also just want to pull back to a little bit about what you were mentioning about, you know, sort of unintended consequences, you know, and the people finding ways around uh, problems because you know I'm reminded uh, you know I, I'm, a, I'm an Australian and Australia at the moment is currently sort of being in a bit of a, a tit for tat trade war with China Australia yeah. called for investigations into into COVID's origins and China got angry and started blocking Australian iron ore or whatever and I just really will open up a, uh, an economic paper I like to read this morning and they say that Australia's trade is is booming and is bigger than ever because China blocked the ore going from Australia, the price of iron ore went up globally because they needed to find it for more expensive elsewhere. And so Australia finds a new market, sells elsewhere and ends yeah. up diversifying as it goes. So now we're less reliant on China. Now, you know, I can't help but see parallels between that, you know, things that are unstoppable, things that are going to happen no matter what. People are clever. People find these solutions and yes. talk about a system that's going to continue no matter what people do decentralized, you know, Bitcoin, uh, you know, is, is going to be such a system. So it's such that a is, powerful idea. That is such an incredibly powerful and, and perfect uh, anecdote uh, of exactly what is going on. And, it's, and again, it's been true forever, right? It was illegal to own gold from 1933 to 1973. People still owned it. Right, they found ways around it. In fact, I actually I was fifth, I was today years old, right? Last week when I learned that Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, whoever he she they are, birthday is April fifth, nineteen seventy three. April fifth was the day in nineteen thirty three that they banned gold, and nineteen seventy three was when they restored the ability to own gold uh, in the United States. I thought that was really cool. Wow. Um, obviously not an too. accident. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, obviously not an accident. Um, and so I, I think what, what is such, why, why that's such a perfect and powerful anecdote is the, the propaganda uh, between governments uh, right now is it, you know, probably second all time highs, right? Probably not as bad as, as you know, WW2, but, but pretty darn, darn close. And why is that? Well, it's because uh, in the normal course of uh, this 90 year cycle throughout history, there's been ebbs and flows. Uh, and, and this, there's lots of books written about this long term cycle about you know globalization and nationalization nationalism and uh it's really interesting right you can go back to 2000 years ago right the silk road existed there was lots of global trade you know people were were explorers we sent out all around the world you can go back to the 1400s or 1600s and so but and then then what happens is 
governments spend too much, people get out over their ski tips and they're like, oh no, we need to, we need to rein in, we need to, to, to nat have nationalism and, and patriotism and, and uh, we need to protect ourselves. And so you go back to Smoot Hawley, you know, 90 years ago, literally 90 years ago in the US, when we tried to protect the US from all the foreign, you know, competitors and, and that protectionism and, and uh, closing of the borders always leads to growth booms in the, the other places, right? So we didn't hurt the, the people who we thought we were hurting by saying that we we're gonna put up big tariffs and trade. They just start trading with each other. And perfect example in, in China or, or Brazil is another one where, you know, US says, all right, we're not gonna export you soybeans. And Brazil's are like, yes, we'll send lots of soybeans to China because we like to make money. And uh, I, I, the, the politicization of, of the virus is, is comical to me, right? I, I point to this, this paper written in 2017 that actually predicted that there would be a pandemic. It would happen in late 2019, 2020, that it would originate in the mountainous region of China. It has nothing to do with laboratory research or Fauci or Wuhan, it has to do with the cycles of heating and cooling around the world. And when, when, the, when the surface of the earth is, is really hot, you don't have a lot of viruses. When the surface of the earth starts to cool, you get more viruses. That's why the plague happened. It's why the Hong Kong flu happened. It's why the, the Spanish flu happened. It's why this one happened. It, it's not rocket science, it's, it's real science. And so all of this, kind of reaction and, and this uh, refocusing on uh, nationalism is, is just a normal cyclical process. You overlay it on a shorter term cycle uh, of you know the Chinese with their 30 year plan. And look, from 2000, I'm uh, sorry, from 1990 to 2020, their goal was simple a harmonious rise to a moderately prosperous socialism economy. Not threatening, kind of nice. We can all applaud lifting all those people out of the, the poverty into the middle class. The next 30 year plan is different to become a global superpower. <laughs> little more threatening, little, little more real. And, and the reality is that that they're going to achieve that. And so that yeah. cycle means they're gonna to have to have other things that they lead in. So what are they spending their time on? They're spending their time on AI, 5G, on building the first you know, digital, elect or, uh, digital currency, not electronic, digital currency, uh, central bank digital currency. They're focusing on globalization, Silk Road project, I mean, or Belt and Road Initiative. They're doing all the things that you would do to counter everyone else going on the normal 90-year uh, cycle and reining in and trying to preserve what they have. And the same thing with, with Bitcoin and, and crypto and, and, and blockchain technology is, look, blockchain technology is not going away. It's an evolution of technology that is unstoppable. There is no chance we're going back to dual entry accounting. There's no chance we were ever gonna go back to single entry accounting. Right. Dual entry is better. Triple entry is better. There is no way we're going back to an undecentralized world. It's just not going to happen. And so you can fight it and you can be the incumbent and you can say all the bad things you want about it and you can make up new narratives and you can say it's only used by drug dealers and terrorists. Come on. Given the choice between sack o money and fingers on a keyboard, people would choose sack o money every single day. Well, except if they're hacking the pipeline here in the U.S. where I couldn't get gas for a week, but uh, and then they use Bitcoin. But it's it's just a better technology that is going to emerge. And what I get really excited about, and, and why I, I you know I can't talk, and and uh, although I'm doing a pretty good job, uh, but why I get so excited about this this past week in in Miami is you're talking about development of a new financial system, literally a new financial system, very akin to, you know, going from the dark ages to 
the Industrial Revolution, from the Industrial Revolution to the age of, of uh, electronics uh, and media, and now we're going to the digital age. And, and that evolution is inevitable. And to fight it rather than embrace it and benefit from it is nonsensical. Why would you do that? It, it just doesn't make sense to me. So then, I mean, you know, thinking about the, the sort of cyclical trends as you spoke about, and then, you know, the almost seemingly hedged counter cyclical trends, you know, you talk about coming from China and that, you know, I suppose not just China, I mean, it's China's the biggest scale, but, you know, other emerging economies and other, others with a, a bit more foresight and sort of at the, at the avant garde, at the cutting edge of, of uh, so many trends, you know, what is it, you know, as, as I like to touch in each month, you know, when we have these conversations, what is it that you see as sort of the, the key trends to look out for. Now we're in, I don't know yeah. if, to, if it's fair to call it a re-emergence economy, uh, but you know, the sort of idea of re-emergence is very, you know, on the minds of people at the moment. What are those key trends now that you're, you're looking towards? Well, the, short, the medium, best long term? news is, is we're definitely going back to normal, right? In terms of uh, being normal of, in terms of living our life, right? We're not gonna be afraid of, of the virus. We're not gonna subject ourselves to, to lockdown. Uh, and, and we're going to actually live our lives. I mean, that was that was evident this week. Um, now there's still places where you have to comply. I still have to wear my mask on the airplane, at least for now. Hopefully, you know, Pete will change that rule. Um, but uh, we're definitely going back to more normal. Now, what that does in my mind is it it will accelerate the. Uh, widespread adoption of these these changes because um, as great as this is right as great as Zoom is and 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 digital collaboration in person relationship building is is really important and and I think that's going to reaccelerate and that's really good uh, I, I think that the um, this reemergence and and uh, and re-stimulation of growth will lessen, I hope, the need for all the artificial nonsense from the central banks, and we'll get back to a more normalized state of you know devaluing currencies around the world. Some say, oh, but that's that's bad for for assets like Bitcoin, and I'm like no, it's it's it might be bad in the short term. But it's super great in the long term um, because I, I don't want I don't want economic disaster. I don't want failure. Right? Somebody said at the, at the conference, right? We need to blow up the old finance. No, 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 no. <laughs> we want to transition to a new system, but we we need the old system to function until such time as as we have the new. So let's let's not blow anything up. That's bad. Um, I also think that uh, what so unintended consequences. What the lockdown taught us was we could get work done. We could find ways around the changes uh, that were made and that we could continue to focus on, on innovation. Uh, and to me, ultimately, and you know, it's, it's my pinned tweet, right? The greatest, the greatest wealth is created by investing in something you believe in before others understand. Uh, innovation as an asset class is the most important thing because it creates all the other things that, that we talk about, you know, stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. None of those would exist if it weren't for innovation. And so uh, having more uh, conversations about these big ideas, turning those conversations into collaborations and projects uh, I think we'll, we'll continue to accelerate. And, um, and I think that all bodes well for that next leap. So in when, and what I mean by that is when you think about what happens in any incumbency shift, there's the fear of the disruption, right? People are going to lose their jobs. You know, let, let's take, you know, settlement of bank loans. Right. Instead of 30 days and hundreds of people, we're going to do it instantaneously with code. Well, what happens to all those people? Yep, they get displaced, and some are going to have to get retrained, and some of them are going to get, have to get absorbed in other in other businesses. But in a world where the creator economy 
allows you to monetize your content. If you are a smart, innovative, creative person, you can transition from a middle person role where you're paid to do a job to building something new. And, and Jimmy Song talks about this really, really well, that an inflationary currency, right? This, this myth of inflation being good for us, but really it's a wealth tax and it's stealing our wealth, basically makes you an indentured servant. And therefore, in a deflationary world with a currency that, that liberates us and allows us to save instead of spend, because if you have an asset that devalues, you want to spend it, right? If you live in Venezuela or Zimbabwe or Argentina or now the United States and your currency is being devalued, you got to spend it. And, and the governments benefit from that because they are rent seekers and, and they have set up the system for a small number of organizations to get really, really rich on that. Well, in a world where your currency, your, your asset appreciates instead of depreciates, now you have time, right? You don't have to go spend it. You, you can actually think, what do I want to do? What am I good at? What are my skills? What's my passion? And that mix of, of mission, passion, and entrepreneurship and innovation, mind-blowing. Mind-blowing what will happen. And it's happened every other time. Every innovation, people say, oh, we're going to lose all these jobs. We have more jobs today than we've ever had in the history of mankind. Full stop. But all the unemployed. Yep. But we have more jobs than any time in history, more prosperity than any time in history. Is it perfect? Do we have lots of poverty? Yes. Is it crazy that I live in a country where we spend $20 billion on weight loss and we have kids going to bed hungry every night? Insane. Insane. How can that be? Right? I actually have an idea to fix that called Plenty for Two. We have meals. Instead of taking 1,400 calories, you eat the 700 that you should and you give the 700 away to someone else. But I got a day job, so I haven't started that. But I mean, that could watch out for that one. I watch out for that one. Yeah. So if anyone wants to do that, come at me and we'll do it together and uh, I'll fund it and you can start it. A good pitch and a good point to, to sort of uh, wrap up there on. Mark, uh, you know, I, I love taking this conversation through the, the realms of history into the future, into the trends of today and tomorrow. But I'm going to give your, your voice a, a rest, let you uh, get through uh, those post Miami, uh, you know, uh, shocks and, and let yourself uh, relax and rest. But as always, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Insightful, innovative, thoughtful as always. So much to think about and so much to be aware of. So for everyone watching, uh, you know, give us a thought, give us a shout out, let us know your ideas and uh, keep watching Reimagine. So much more good stuff to come. No, nah, thanks, Ash. I really appreciate it. Uh, love doing this with you guys. And uh, I, I did make one really smart decision, which was the reason I didn't have to cancel today is uh, at the Winklevoss party uh, on Friday, I decided to go home before it really got started. So I, I am able to function today, but I think a whole bunch of people stayed up really, really, really late. And uh, I'm just... Uh, I think young, but I, I definitely am not. So absolutely. Uh, sometimes the, the body has to take its rest as it needs to be. Sensible awesome. moves. And I'm glad you made it here today. Thanks, Ash. All right. Thanks, Buck.